This is the Guns Magazine podcast, episode number 83. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting people who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. First, before we get started, let's talk about our great sponsors. 1791 Gun Leather is the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, and they'd like you to know their appreciation for the Second Amendment fuels their passion for gun leather and its representation of the original patriots of this great nation. 100% certified American steer hide joins four generations of professional leather artisans, creating the perfect firearms holsters. Carry your firearms with pride, knowing that each 1791 gun leather holster is handcrafted to be the best holster for your firearm. See the full product lineup at 1791gunleather.com. The supporting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast is Hodgden Powder. Available in granular powder and pellets, Hodgson's family of 777 powders gives muzzle-loading enthusiasts a quick-cleaning low-odor black powder substitute for rifle and pistol applications. To learn more, visit Hodgson.com. In this episode, we caught up with frequent guest Roy Huntington to talk about his profound, some might even say unnatural, I'm just kidding, Roy, love for small-frame revolvers. Whether you're talking about the ubiquitous detective special or some other snubby, you know Roy probably already owns three of them. Now here's my interview with Roy Huntington about his love for two-inch barrels and small frame revolvers. Well, Roy, thanks for talking to us. How have you been? Uh, Just fine and anxious to be back on the show. So thanks for inviting me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, cool. Well, we were talking the other day and uh, working on an upcoming uh, piece for, I think, the October issue. We were talking about, uh, John Taffin was talking about hand loading for small frame revolvers. And I know you're just a huge, huge fan of, of small frame revolvers, snubbies, J frames, that kind of cool stuff. And I've owned a few. I've I've shot a few, um, but you're you're all over them. So make me a, a convert. I think it's a sickness. I really do. <laughs> it's and and you can't get vaccinated against it. I think if they, if they vaccinate you for so you don't like small frame revolvers, that means they have to introduce some of the genes into you, and then <laughs> and then it's too late. It just it they stay with you forever. So, uh, I you know for me it goes all the way back to when I was probably eight years old. Believe it or not. All I really remember is I was with my dad. We were visiting my grandpa, my mom's uh, father. We were in Steubenville, Ohio, of all <laughs> things. So this would have been pro oh, circa 1960, maybe. Wow. And uh, yeah, uh, 61, maybe. And uh, there, you know how when you're a little kid, sometimes all you know is that the adults are acting mysteriously and you don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So we were, we went to this guy's house in our car and all I was, you know, you're just a kid, right? So you're just doing whatever they tell you to do. And so we went into this old house and we met this old guy and then he brought a box out. And I, all I remember is that there was a, a blue steel double action revolver in 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 my adult eyes i think it was like a colt police positive Uh and then there was a two inch top break chrome plated pearl grip smith and wesson snubby of some sort a hammerless gun an early gun yeah and i remember my dad and he were talking back and forth and of course everybody was smoking cigarettes and yeah you know (laughs) and uh and I remember my dad handed him up some money, which I found out later on was ten dollars, which was kind of big money yeah. in those days. And uh, and then my dad took the gun and put it in his pocket, and we everybody left and we went home. And then that's all I knew. All I knew is that wow, that was really cool. Whatever that was, it wasn't until I was a little older, you know, maybe ten or eleven or so, and he showed me the gun and he told me what was going on that day. And that's all it was. It was a family friend and. He wanted to sell a gun, and my dad was due to be shipped overseas, so he wanted to get my mom a little thirty-eight to have at home. And 
the, I think the cool part of that story is not only would that qualify as my vaccination, but it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I still have that gun. And I actually shot it for an insider column a couple of years ago. And uh, but that really I can put my finger on that and say that's the moment that I became sort of enamored with these small, interesting you know, colorful, versatile, useful guns, you know, the little small frame revolvers. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about the useful side of it, because I've made an interesting observation that a lot of the uh, the guys that I really look up to uh, trainers or guys that have, uh, you know, been there, done that a lot of them carry as a backup piece is a, a small a snubby. And I thought that was interesting the first time I saw it, but then I, I've seen it a lot. And if those guys choose that as their second gun, that tells me there's a lot of good reasons for it. Well, who put your hand up if you've ever had an auto pistol jam or malfunction. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> raises their hand. Everybody raises their hands. Now, I would challenge most people to remember a time when they had a revolver malfunction, you know, that wasn't an extenuating circumstance, you know, bad ammo or it was a bit, had been abused really badly or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the number of times I'm 66 years old, I've been shooting for, I don't know, 60 years and thousands of revolvers. And I don't think I've actually really ever had a double action revolver uh, f malfunction, you know, on me, except just once or twice. Yeah. And once was a, a broken mainspring uh, on a Colt revolver, which is unheard of, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I agree with you. I think because the savvy people, if you are back to your reaching in your pocket for your backup gun, you can't afford it to go wrong. Yep. You know? And I, I believe in stacking the deck just absolutely as high as you can in your favor. And so, you know, that's why to this day you're you're going to see me within in hand reach of a five or six shot small frame revolver. Well, and, you know, the immediate action, you know, on a, on a semi-auto pistol is tap rack and some say bang, some say assess with with a uh uh, revolver, uh, the, the real complicated uh, malfunction clearance is what? You press the trigger again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was a reserve on the uh, Chula Vista Police Department in the 70s, in the middle 70s. And uh, we had, we bought some ammunition from a company, a, a major company at the time. <laughs> and we actually ended up with two on duty ammunition malfunctions misfires on you know during police shootings oh wow and i remember vi we were a small agency there were 30 or 40 officers but i remember vividly talking to the uh, one female and she said sh she said i pulled the trigger and it went click and i pulled the trigger again and it went click oh. and then she pulled the trigger again and the gun fired and put the bad guy down yeah but that, that illustrates exactly what you're talking about. There is no time for tap rack bank, but she was toe to toe with this guy. Yeah. You know? And, uh, I, and yes, is it, that's 99.99999% of the time. I think you'll find that kind of reliability, but geez, I can't, I can never remember picking up a Smith and Wesson J frame and pulling the trigger and having it not go bang, but I'll give you a long list of small frame <laughs> semi-autos, <laughs> you know. Well, exactly. And the, and the smaller they are, the uh, typically, you know, the, the more it, uh, problems they have. Not always, but a lot of times that's generally smaller gun, bigger problems. Well, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things about the current generation of small frame 380 autos, like the Ruger LCP, LCP2, you know, some of the other small frame guns like that. They seem to have sorted that out. And I have to say that I'm I'm pretty pretty secure with a modern production small frame auto but the other side of that coin though is that you know when i was on the san diego police department we had a guy in a big fight on the side of a freeway and he went to his backup gun and it was a, a semi-auto in an ankle holster and he got it out and what did he do he mashed it up against the bad guy's <laughs> chest and pulled the trigger and it had pushed the gun out of battery yep and he had the presence of mind, believe it or not, because he told me, he said, Roy, when I did it, I realized what I did. I pulled my hand away. 
and then he was able to shoot the guy. Isn't that something? Wow. In the I middle know, of a fight. Want, yeah, but I don't want to have to think about that. So <laughs> Exactly. Now, on, on you know, your small frame, I know I'm thinking of a good friend of mine that carries it as a backup. He He's not a big laser fan, but he carries a laser on his uh, backup piece on the revolver. And his, his idea is... If you go, as you said, if you go to your backup gun, things have gone about as as horribly wrong as you could ever imagine. And he says that's a time when you probably, you know, maybe you're shot in your your primary hand. You know, you've broken an arm. You're barely conscious. He says, you know, at least with that, I can pull it out with either hand and the laser will get me pretty close to where I need to be. I think you're right. And, uh, you know, I, I think lasers are really personal. I don't carry one on my guns. I used to, and I just changed my thinking. But somebody built a really compelling case for it one time during a training situation. And that was just that. Uh, he said, he showed me, he said, you know, you've got blood in your eye, you're on the ground, you're shooting with your off hand. And he said, you're able to effectively put rounds on a target by seeing where the red dot is. And, you know, even if you're not really aiming the gun out in front of you, like if you're holding it out to your side, <laughs> you know, yep. uh, or you're holding it with your broken arm and you can still just like, oh, there's the dot and then pull the trigger. And I thought, wow, that's a really compelling thing. And and of course, you look at Crimson Trace laser grips and they're absolutely perfect for these small frame revolvers, you know. You know, and but there's a flip side of this, too. And you you make the point uh uh, frequently that these are not beginner guns because unfortunately a lot of guys will say well i'll get me a a little snubby 38 for the little lady well that might not be the optimal thing as you say they're they tend to be expert guns talk a little bit about that well you know you're so right and it makes me crazy and i owned a gun store years ago and i've worked behind the counter at gun stores and you're right it's this you know we we redneck you know know it all gun guys you know we, <laughs> we 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 bring our wives in there and we say hey uh hey little lady you know let's get this gun for you and it's a little something revolver or something and and then of course they'll load it with 357 magnum ammunition she shoots it <laughs> one time and she's scared to death of it forever and you know and i always say well what if your wife took you into the store and said hey honey i'm gonna get you this cute little gun here what would we do <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. so uh no, they are an expert's gun. And, you know, I I used to buy small frame revolvers. So I'm not regularly, but every once in a while when I w was on the range, because you would, some detective who would maybe shot his gun one time this year <laughs> would show up to qualify and they would shoot with a J frame or a small frame revolver at seven or 10 yards and, and miss the silhouette target. Uh. And you'd see him cursing and everything. Well, I used to always have a hundred, Chris new hundred dollar bill in my wallet. And I'd say, yeah, they're really garbage. Aren't they? Hey, you know, I give you a hundred <laughs> bucks for it, you know? <laughs> yep. And then, uh, and then end up with a really good guy. If they were good, nice guys, I would say, can I show you something? And, and invariably, if you, you take the gun and you could shoot it and you shoot it well. And then I would show them how to control it, you know, squeeze the trigger properly, have a good grip. And then usually just within a couple of cylinderfuls, they're on the target now. And then suddenly they're like, wow, you know, <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. Yep. So, yeah, we used to shoot uh, 100 and 200 yard steel silhouettes with J frames and people, you know, they would just they didn't believe what they were seeing. And it's not that hard. You know, but if you don't know how to control the trigger, then it is hard. Exactly. Well, you know, we've talked about the practical purposes and they, they are many, but now I'm going to kind of get into the esoteric and, and test your powers of waxing poetic. What is it about them that you just love? Let's take the, the practical angle out of it. Obviously, you have a, a love affair and you called it a sickness, I think, when we got started. <laughs> what is it that grabs your soul with these guns? I think part of it is genetic and in the sense that the, one of my earliest fondest memories is being with my father while we were there visiting with this old man. And that was my first sort of real life experience seeing a real gun like that. You know, we had been around BB guns and, you know, bolt action, 16 gauge shotguns a little bit and stuff like that. But this is like TV stuff. You know, this yeah. is, this is, you know, the, the untouchables. <laughs> right. And I, I, I remember that seeing that blue cult and just thinking, wow, this is the real deal. 
And, uh, and then I think it's just built on that. And I don't really understand why some of us have the affliction of why we, we're gun cranks. You know, why, <laughs> why is, well, I mean, why is that? And I, and I really can't, I don't understand it. I mean, if you show me a revolver and then put it away and then ask me if I want to see the next one, I'm going to say yes, even if it's exactly the same as the other one. And so I don't know what that is all about. But I think for the J frames, it, it's a bit like having a really good pocket knife or a, an, an excellent pocket tool is it kind of really is a jack of all trades and in that it's convenient, it's light, it's reliable. You'll always have it with you. It's powerful enough to be effective. It's accurate enough you know, to hit what you're aiming at. And, uh, and there's a certain history and I don't know that panache is the right word, but there's, you know, if they were good enough for Elliot Ness, then by golly, they're good enough for us. Uh, <laughs> and you're obviously wildly, crazily, madly in love with them. So I'll ask you the next obvious follow on question of, of all your children. So which one's your favorite? And I mean, you know, small frame revolvers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you fight dirty. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think if I had to have one, it would be a, and I, and I own it, as a matter of fact, it's a third year production Smith & Wesson Model 36 uh, J-frame, blued two inch round butt with a flat latch on the side. It's what I would, I would call it the epitome of the breed. Ah. If, if somebody says, "Oh, it's a snubby," then then in my book, this is what you know. This is what they're talking about. But having said that, you know, an early cult detective special, or uh, you know, the, I mean, the list goes on from there. But if 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 the terribleness happened, and I had to just have one, that's the one I would have. And I think not necessarily because it's better or faster or shinier or you know or more powerful or anything. I think it's it's indicative of the breed, you know, it's yeah. like, it's like, yeah, it's like a guy who has a really handsome eight point buck up on his wall and people say, well, now, you know, I saw a 12 point one the other day, or I saw this one that was 250 pounds or I saw, but when you look at this, when you say, yeah, but you know what, that's a really nice deer right there. Yeah. You know? Yep. And, and it's kind of that, you know, and invariably when I show it to somebody, cause I'll show them different guns and this J frame and this Colt and this, and when I hand this to them, there's something about it. Cause even people who aren't really gun people will look at it and they'll go, wow, that's really pretty. What is that? And then <laughs> if you tell them the history, they kind of go, wow, this is how, this is older than you. Yeah. You know, Moss Ayub uh, did a piece recently for, for guns, and and I can't think off the top of my head which issue it was in, but uh, he, he talked about hammerless guns. So you like them or don't like them? I do. The Centennials and the, the bodyguard is the one that's the kind of a humpy back on it. Yeah. And it has an external hammer, and so you can just get your thumb on it if you ever want to cock it, which I think is ridiculous because you really would never shoot these guns single action. There's no reason for it. Uh, but that's the old school guys. They wanted to be able to cock their gun. It's a, it's a misnomer too. Cause even the Centennial and the quote hammerless guns, actually they have a hammer, right? Uh, you just, you just can't see it. It's underneath, you know, the, the way that the frame is shaped. I have one, I have a custom one by uh, Gemini customs. Mark Morganti did it. And it's an absolutely st stunning piece of engineering. Cause he takes what's arguably one of the best style guns that there is. And then of course, you know, does the action and makes a custom barrel for it. And it just does all kinds of other things to it. And uh, you end up with something that's just superlative. Um, and one of the things he, he did to it is he put a set of custom grips and which, which is another feature I think and benefit of these little guns is the fact that, yeah, you can buy a Ruger LCP two 380 and they're wonderful. And I have one and I carry it in my pocket except you're not going to do anything about grips other than take what they gave you because that's it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can, you can wrap some duct tape around it if you want to, or something like that. But with revolvers, it gives you the option of changing the grip profile to really anything you can imagine. And so, you know, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of grip shapes and styles and materials and colors and, you know, designs uh, created specifically to meet the needs of people who have a different idea of what they're, you know, how they want their gun to, to fit them. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you can buy a, 
a small frame revolver, and if you get a Colt or a Smith & Wesson or something, then you can buy a set of custom grips that will fit your hand well, which you and I both know goes a long ways toward being able to shoot them better. Yes. Well, no discussion of, of snubbies and, and small revolvers, even though I've a lot of these are, are large frame, but... I have to mention the fits. Uh, we've got a, a cover story in the August issue of Guns Magazine, uh, written by John Taffin, talking about the Fitz revolver. And I didn't even know what they were. I'd seen them, but I didn't really know them until my, my good friend Ken Campbell is a huge Fitz aficionado. And he had our, our mutual friend Bobby Tyler, Tyler Gunworks, build him up a beautiful one. And I, I forget the model he built it on. But uh, have you got any Fitzes? You know, I, I haven't had an authentic one, but uh, I've had them come and go, and I've built a few in my times. Uh, if Fitzgerald was a Mr. Revolver between the wars, and he worked at Colt, and he he wrote uh, a couple of books, um, and I'm blanking on the name of it. It's, uh, it's not Fast and Fancy Revolver Shooting is by Ed McGivern, and I can't remember the book, the name that Fitz wrote, but he he was really a groundbreaker when it came to police training and tactics and, and that kind of stuff. But what he really was, was an amazing gunsmith. And what Fitz did was he cut the front portion of the trigger guards out of two large frame Colt revolvers, cut the barrel way down to two inch. They were, I think they were 45 Colt revolvers. Yeah. And, uh, and I, he may have snubbed the hammer. I, I think he experimented with that a little bit, but I can't recall for sure. And so and he carried one in each of, of the front pockets of his trousers. Of course, in those days, men were men, and <laughs> you know they wore they wore heavy wool trousers with suspenders, and so you had there was room in there, and you could actually pack a you know a large frame short barrel revolver in your pocket, which yep. he did. Uh, and a lot of people misunderstood something too, is that they thought that he cut away the trigger guard to to access the trigger fast. But that isn't the case. And he de used to demonstrate this when he would do police training, is that someone would hold a revolver on him with their finger in the trigger guard. And Fitz was fast enough that he would demonstrate how to take the revolver out of your hand and break your finger and, uh -huh. while doing it, see? And so he cut the front of the trigger guard away so nobody could break his finger if they tried to grab his gun. Oh, really? Uh-huh, Yeah. And uh, and that actually ended up get the the uh, Texas Rangers were famous for carrying Colt 1911s, and there was a couple of real famous guy guys there. One of them was a Lone Wolf Gonzalez was his mm -hmm. name, and he was a captain in Texas Rangers. But he had a pair of engraved Colt 1911s, and he had the trigger guards cut away. Ah. And it was it was exactly for that same reason. So it wasn't because they thought they were being you know fast, <laughs> you know, and. Uh, uh, so that's what, yeah, Fitz is, is, that's astounding. I actually have a bottle of Fitz oil, which <laughs> a, a reader gave me. It's really collectible, but it's got his picture on the cover or on the bottle. And it was made in the early 30s sometimes. And, and it's his signatures on the bottle. It's the most astounding thing. But yeah, Fitz was certainly famous. And, uh, and I think a real Fitz revolver, oh gosh, I would be, I'm mortified to think how much they would be worth. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they seem to kind of be one of those things that have, you know, kind of come back again, and now they're kind of cool. But as we said in the August issue, they are the connoisseur gunfighters uh, handgun. So. Well, that's it. I think if somebody didn't know, they'd look at it and say, well, that's stupid. Who <laughs> cut that gun up? You know? Can you, I mean, we were laughing behind the scenes. Can you imagine the legal department of, of any revolver manufacturer today? You bring that to them and say, yeah, we're going to cut the trigger guard off. What? <laughs> I hey, don't that's think an so. Idea. I'll pitch Smith and Wesson. Hey, I have an idea. Why don't you cut the trigger guard off of some of your revolvers? <laughs> it's like that's a movie. Then the next need. scene is you being bodily thrown out of the, the front gate. <laughs> that's right. In handcuffs. I oh. know what you mean. Well, Roy, it's been great talking to you about small frame revolvers. It's something that I don't have that much experience with. And I, I've got to admit, I just don't have the love or the bug like you do, but Maybe there, there's always hope, and maybe you can uh, let me see the light one of these days, and we'll keep, we'll keep trying. <laughs> I promise I'll do my best to bring you over to the, <laughs> the real side. I'm sure you will. Well, thanks for talking to us on the Guns Magazine podcast, Roy. All right, Brent. Looking forward to it.
As always, it was great talking to Roy, and we'll do it again sometime soon. And with that, we hope you're enjoying the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first in the business, and we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got questions or comments about the show, please email me. That's editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast catcher, YouTube, and of course at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com and AmericanCop.com. We'd also appreciate it if you'd share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. And don't forget to check out the presenting sponsor of the Guns Magazine podcast, 1791 Gun Leather. You can learn more about their great holsters at 1791GunLeather.com. That's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>